So it's well known that, well, OK, before that, let me just say x is going to be an algebraic variety where field k will have some restriction on the k in very soon. So it's well known that uh, if the sheaf of uh, Kähler differentials is locally free, then x is non-singular. And then uh, a possible question is, what if we, we know less, that we only know that the dual of this Thank you. <laughs> that would be an easy question if I had that chief. So what if this is locally free? Does that imply the same? Okay. So this is the Lipman Zariski. Conjecture. Or I guess conjecture is that this holds and uh, otherwise you cannot you can say it's uh, the Lipman Zariski question. Uh, Lipman right away pointed out that this fails in characteristic zero a uh, characteristic P, so positive characteristic. And very simple example, if you just take x, y minus z to the p, where the characteristic is p, then um, tx is generated. So this is inside uh, a3. Then tx is generated by the vector fields delta, delta z, and x delta x minus y delta y and let me check that yeah and so it's locally free but uh, but that's not uh, non-singular and so we're going to assume characteristic zero and let me just uh, rest restrict to C um, with that. So at the same time, Lippmann proved that uh, the assumption that the tangent sheaf is locally free implies that x is normal. And this is actually not, not that easy. And a corollary of this is that the as -E conjecture holds for curves. And this is under the assumption that the characteristic is zero. Uh, even this fails in characteristic P. So an example of that is x to the P equals y to the P plus one. Uh, so characteristic P, this is not, not happening. I don't know an easy proof. So it's, uh, well, it's not too complicated, but it's not two lines. <laughs> well, <laughs> so Lippmann's proof is about two pages in, in print. So it's sort of, and he's looking at depth. And basically, uh, he doesn't say that he's checking Sayre's norm normality condition. So um, if you know an easy proof, I think that would be interesting. So, okay. So there were some early results. So to be honest, I don't know what exactly Zariski had to do with this, but I, I suppose he, he had to have something <laughs> to do with it. But uh, so I, I, so Lippmann, this, this result is in a, a paper of Lippmann in 65. 
I'm sorry? Right, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, so I guess uh, it, he may have told him to do that, and I guess this was around the time he was a student, so yeah, so yeah, exactly. I'm just saying I, I don't know the exact way it, was, it worked out. But so some early results. Okay, I'm not sure how to say this name, Shaya. Okay. <laughs> and Stork in 72 did confirm the, so all of these are positive results, so I'll just list the case. So X is a hypersurface. Moon 73, if X is a homogeneous complete intersection. Hoxter in 77 for spe uh, it doesn't matter so it's a local question but uh, just think of a uh, think of PN but it's really just uh, um, Um, right, sorry. Uh, so it's, uh, okay, I'm not sure how to say the, the best way. So take a, a homogeneous complete intersection, or a complete intersection PN, and then the cone over that. So it's the spec of the ring that, uh, uh, I think any. So, and then Huxter did uh, spec R for an arbitrary graded ring R. Okay, um, graded and uh, so at the irrelevant ideal. You know, it may be smooth complete intersection. No, 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 I think it's less than the So you take a gradient ring, take spec R, and take the vertex, the cone point. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, so it is kind of the same. Well, this, this beats that. Yeah, yeah. But it was later, so. <laughs> okay. And then kind of a, a more geometric approach by von Straten, von Straten and Steinbrink. This is 85. So they did it under the assumption that the dimensions are at least three and the singular set is isolated. Well, no, uh, so assume that you have that kind of singularity, and then if Tx is free, then it's actually smooth. No, 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 no. Right, so it's, it's a little bit weird, but yeah, so if you, want, if you want a positive statement, then it's saying that if you have these kind of singularities and it's really singular, then Tx is not locally free. Okay, and then uh, Flanner in 88, essentially kind of a, something that you're going to say follows from this. So he did when the co-dimension of the singular set is at least three. Now, what they did was actually a little bit more and I'll explain that. So, uh, so this one, uh, follows from that just by taking uh, uh, general hyperplane cuts. Or I think it does, right? Uh, 
as long as the singular set is positive dimensional, if you have a general Hopi plane cloud, it will intersect it. And then uh, if Tx is uh, locally free, the uh, normal bundle is uh, locally free because uh, it's a hyperplane. So then the kernel of that will be the uh, uh, tangent uh, sheaf of the. But anyway, so they did something else. And in that context, this is really more. So what is that something else? And so now the Monty Python style, uh, style to something not completely different. Uh, so extending differential forms. So these ta last two results are really about uh, extending differential forms. So what is that? So let's say uh, so you have x, and then so you have the regular part. And because of Lippmann, we may assume, so let me put it here. So I switched over to work over C, and uh, we can actually assume that this is normal. OK. And so you can look at the smooth part, take a differential form, and ask whether it extends to x, or well, what does that really mean? Well, what it means is uh, you want to look at a resolution of singularities. And then there's a preimage of the uh, regular part. You may even assume that it's isomorphic to the original one. So you have a differential form there. And you want to extend it to x little. Now, if x were so, if we were on x, uh, we know that the codimension of uh, the complement of this is two, or at least two. So, you could extend it as a reflexive form, or you can extend the sheaf of differentials from the smooth part uh, as, a, as a reflexive sheaf to x. But here, the complement is one-dimensional or one codimensional, sorry. So it's not totally obvious that it can be extended. So uh, let me put it uh, slightly differently. So let's say that I have an open set in X. And uh, right, so for any resolution of singularities, so I, I don't want to restrict to requiring that it doesn't change the regular part. But since x is normal, I can always assume that there's an open set whose, co whose complement is codimension at least 2. And uh, the resolution is uh, an isomorphism over, over u. So there's always an open set such that uh, pi inverse u, u is an isomorphism, and the codimension in X of the complement of U is at least two. Okay? And then the question is can we extend differential forms on U to X twiddle, right? This is a, so I start on X, I have a differential form on this open set. But I can think of that open set sitting in x twiddle, and I want to extend it to the entire x twiddle. Okay. So now I didn't say what kind of differential forms, but you can ask for any. So let's say we we look at q forms. So on on x twiddle, I have a restriction map from differential Q forms to the same thing on the pre-image of U. But by the uh, requirement that this is the same as U, this 
is the same as q four and u. Now, what is this? Well, x little is pi inverse x. So I can think of this this uh, group as the global sections on x of the push forward of this sheet. Mm -hmm. And of course, clearly, this map is injected, right? Because I, I have a locally free sheaf, and I restrict to an open set. So, so this is an injective map. And then the question is, so that question is whether this is subjective, right? So this question is equivalent to, let's call this rho. Is rho subjective? Or rather, when is rho subjective? OK? OK. So now I went back to work on x. And on x, I know that the complement of u has codimension at least 2. So I know what, what it means that this map is subjective. It means that this sheaf is reflexive. Right? We are on a normal, so x is normal, so it's S2. So this means that this is equivalent to the question, when is the push forward of this sheaf reflexive? I'm sorry, I can't hear. I'm sorry, I don't. Yes, yes. It has been yeah. the same as the push forward. Right, right. Exactly. So, uh, so since x is S2, um, if I take the, so I could just, right. So this is the same thing as H0x i lower star omega u cube. Is this what you're asking? Yeah. Right, so you can ask it that way, that whether push forward from the open set is the same as push forward uh, from a resolution. So I'm going to say that the extension theorem holds if this happens. So I have, uh, say, an open set or even the regular set of x. Well, clearly, uh, this, all of this works for, for the regular part. So once I'm looking at this, then, um, well, now I still need to, to have the resolution. OK? So uh, that's when we are saying that the resolution, uh, the extension theorem holds. Now, what Von Strahlen and Steinbrink did was prove that they proved the extension theorem holds under these conditions. And they proved that uh, under these conditions, the extension theorem implies the lippmann zariski conjecture. And then what Flenner did was he extended the extension theorem into this uh, uh, context. So let's see. Uh, so this is actually relatively simple. So this is. Uh, from von Straten and, and Steinbrink that uh, under those conditions, so basically uh, if the singular set is isolated and the extension theorem holds, then the Lippmann-Zariski conjecture holds. Okay, and the proof is this. So clearly, this is a local question on x. So we might as well assume that the, the tangent sheaf is uh, free and take a local trivialization of that. So these are uh, uh, vector fields 
uh, generating uh, the tangent sheaf, or if you want the tangent sheaf near a point. Now, since uh, so around singular points, if you uh, restrict to your neighborhood, then l under any local automorphism, that point will be uh, fixed. So uh, these vector fields can be uh, lifted. So, mm -hmm. so these can be lifted to x twiddle. Let's say we have on x twiddle. And now let's look at them just on the uh, pre-image of, of u. So on pi inverse u, well, there's uh, nothing happens. So if I restrict to the pre-image of u, then these are uh, locally freely generating the tangent sheaf. So we have a dual basis. Let's say eta 1, eta n. So these are sections of just 1. And so by dual basis, I mean that when we apply one onto the other, well, whichever way, I guess let's put it this way. This is delta ij. And now, yeah, actually, I skipped one step. So when we lift these vector fields, then just by the construction, they land in the part of the uh, So they actually not just lie in the tangent sheaf, but they lie in the part that vanishes on the exceptional set. So let's say E is the exceptional set and assume that, that pi is a log resolution. And by that, I just mean that the exceptional set is a simple normal crossing divisor. Is that OK? So now, if I restrict these to E, then these actually land in the tangents, that tangent sheaf of E. Okay. So if I evaluate these vector fields at any point on E, so let's say for any y on E, if I evaluate these these lie in the tangent space at y. Now I don't mean this talk of the point, I just mean the uh, the fiber of the of the vector bundle. There. Yeah. That they're tangent to. Yeah, and also when you dualize, yeah. you know, uh, on omega, the map from omega to log is is injective, but then when you dualize, that's also injective. So, okay. So the, the liftability is basically, so I'll have a little bit better statement on that soon, but I'm not planning to prove it, so I might as well tell you now. So basically what you do is you look at uh, local group actions, 
and then you want to lift the local group action. Yeah, exactly. So you can think of it as a local C action. And then you lift that. And here, the only trick is that the, the point is fixed by the local group action. So you can, you can lift the, the map. But nowadays, you can do a little bit better because uh, there is functorial resolution. And using functorial resolutions, you can actually lift any, any local group action. So it doesn't even have to be uh, uh, isolated. So basically, you just, so a local group action is um, you have some map from G cross the, uh, or a neighborhood of the uh, identity in G cross your variety that you're acting on. And then you do a, a functorial resolution of this product. And that will actually give you a, a but the group itself is smooth. So um, the functoriality of the resolution means that it, it commutes with the uh, base change by a smooth map. So the map from G, or this action, is smooth. And then uh, the base change means that the resolution of the, the product is actually giving you the group action upstairs. Does it make sense? Yeah. Now the differential forms pick up poles. Yeah, right. I mean, if you if you blow up a point, uh, then you know that's the usual thing that uh, the definition of terminal singularities. If you want. so, you have a, a, a two form on a on a surface. When you blow up, you pick up a, a pole along the device. Well. But I, I don't think it actually matters. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. I mean, this, this is what it means, right? No, but the differential forms pick up a zero. No. No, differential forms pick up a pole. Well, I mean, what does it mean that kx little equals pi upper star kx plus e? Yes, you're, you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I totally buy the argument. I completely buy the argument. But I don't have that. Okay. I'm, you know, not very good. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm always, I'm always conflicted by, you know, when when you write things down, and <laughs> versus to say poles and zeros. Yeah. I, <laughs> so I, I'm confident that that this is correct, whatever we call it. Yeah. Okay. But then, so if you if you buy this, yeah. then we're done. No, but there's no plus. Yeah, okay. then so I in, in the tangent, <laughs> so there's plus log in, in, in omega, yeah, yeah. right? So you can have, you can have different log poles on differential forms, and they translate to log zeros in vector fields. So this means that they, they, they're tangent to, to E. OK? And the, so, okay, let's do this quickly. So if you have omega x little, this maps to omega x little log e. And this maps to ei for the 
irreducible components. So you, you have the short exact sequence for any simple normal crossing divisor. Now, if you dualize this, then the dual of this is zero, right? Is it supported on, on a proper closed subset? So you get the dual of this, which is what I call this. So the, the dual sequence will be this. And then this is kind of, you know, this x1 of this guy into ox little, whatever that is. But then when I restrict to e, this maps to the normal bundle. So this is the normal bundle of E, or normal sheet, right? And then this maps to TE. <coughs> is that OK? OK, so homework, check that this diagram is correct. Is this acceptable? Okay, so, so that's, that's the key that, so if these vector fields land in here, when you evaluate them on E, they will be in the tangent space to E. But the problem with that is that E has not enough dimension, right? This is n, n minus one dimensional, but we have a dual basis. And this still holds at that point, or should. So this, and this contradict each other. So, yeah, so this is wrong. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so. <coughs> right. Um, right, okay. sorry. I, <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. So I need the extension result because I, I only have these here, right? So I need to extend them to, thank you. I, <laughs> I didn't say the key, key step. That I know this on the, comp, on, on the primage of you, and the extension theorem tells me that these extend uh, to the entire x twiddle, but then this relation stays true, right? And I, need, I want to use this on E, so I need to extend the differential form to there. Okay. Okay. So, um, so what's missing here to sort of uh, a general ex uh, extension theorem implies uh, the Lippmann Zariski is this lifting thing, which is, but I essentially gave you a proof of that. So it's just that at that time this functorial resolution wasn't known, uh, but now uh, you can essentially. Oh, this is green. Uh, you can, can you can the just the what? Uh, functorial resolution. Of the so, um, by functorial resolution, I mean uh, what's in Collard's book on resolution of singularities, that uh, there exists a functor that assigns a resolution to any uh, variety with some properties. And one of the properties is that it's invariant under smooth base change. And basically the proof is that there's an algorithm for, for resolving singularities. And you just make all the choices before you choose x. So you say, okay, this is how I'm going to resolve it. So it doesn't say, so for surfaces, there's a minimal resolution, right? So there's kind of a, a unique one. There's no statement of uniqueness or any properties of this resolution. So it's not, not a minimum resolution or anything like that. It just apply this algorithm to anything. And he proves that uh, it works. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So basically we have that the extension theorem implies the uh, lippmann zariski conjecture. So uh, that's how uh, they did that. And let's see what's next. As usual, I'm not even halfway through. Actually, I just didn't, uh, didn't 
turn the page. OK, so more recent results. Um, so in a joint paper with Grabe, Kebekus, myself, and Peter now, we proved that the extension theorem holds. Uh, well, okay. Um, well, in this form, it holds for uh, for x klt. I could say, um, okay. So we have actually a, a little bit more more general statement, but under uh, uh, so far that we developed, uh, this is what uh, would be the uh, the right statement. And then using that argument, it also implies LZ. OK. Yes. In general. So, uh, so that's why I crossed this out, that the only thing that, that was sort of holding them this statement they never made this statement, so they are they are basically just giving a proof under those conditions of Lipman Zariski. But if you examine this proof, the only part where they really use uh, the isolatedness is the lifting of these uh, uh, vector fields, and now we can do it without that. So if you want formally, this was done by Grabe, Kebekus, and myself, uh, but it was basically just this addition that uh, uh, using the um. But I mean, so, so, so the extension theorem definitely fails. Yes, right. So, which surfaces are KFT? I'm sorry? Which surfaces are KFT? Which surfaces are KFT? Okay, thank you. So, let me actually state a slightly more general statement. So actually, we came to this from a different uh, motivation. So uh, we actually needed an extension theorem for, for something else. And this is really what we proved there. So if x delta is log canonical, So that actually includes uh, simple elliptic singularities, for example, a, a cone over an elliptic curve uh, for surfaces. So uh, it's uh, slightly larger than, than that. And the twiddle denotes the largest reduced divisor contained in the preimage of the non-KLT locus. So on X, look at the part, the, there's a closed subset outside of which X delta is KLT, and take the, the smallest closed subset of, of that has this property, that's the non-KLT locus, and then take its preimage and take the largest reduced divisor that's contained in it, then pi r star omega X to the Q log d twiddle is reflexive uh, for any key. So in particular, if x delta is klt, then this is empty. So you have the uh, extension theorem. Okay? And let me point out that as long as you're only interested in the lipman zariski conjecture, uh, you can always, so even if your pair has some um, MMP style uh, restriction on the singularities, you, at least for the lipman zariski con, uh, conjecture, uh, you could drop the uh, divisor because if the tangent sheaf is locally free, then that means that the 
dual of the uh, Kähler differentials is also locally free, and therefore omega, the little omega, so the canonical <coughs> bundle or canonical sheaf is uh, invertible. So it's uh, so then any of these conditions for a pair imply that the ambient space itself has the same condition. So if x delta is log canonical, then x is log canonical. For the extension theorem, we don't have that assumption. So sometimes you need the data. You cannot just drop that. And also, our interest in this is coming from having already a, a pair and wanting to extend uh, uh, logarithmic differential form. So there's, there's sort of an additional issue that if you already have a delta here, and let's say, let's say it's reduced for simplicity, and you have some differential forms with logarithmic poles along delta, then you can ask the same question, do they extend on the, uh, on the resolution? And over points of delta, this is slightly different question. So I'll, I'll show you in a, a few minutes that uh, there is actually uh, some, some difference in, in asking these. So I've, I've been saying that we had different motivation. Let me quickly tell you uh, some other applications of this that are separate from the litman zariski conjecture. What's can, you, can you hope for extension theorem? Yes, that, that's coming. OK, so applications of this theorem, other than the lippmann zariski conjecture, our original motivation was actually the bogomolov somaze type vanishing for singular varieties. So the bogomolov somaze vanishing originally is that if you have a, a, a line bundle contained in some uh, uh, sheaf of differential forms, so for example, omega q, and you have a, a lower bound on, let me just write it up, and then it will be easier. So. Um, OK, so the original problem of Somaze vanishing is that let's say you have a line bundle in omega xq log some, uh, some divisor. And then um, this means that the Kodaria dimension of A is at most q. Now, how is this really a vanishing theorem? So this embedding, you can think of this as a section of this sheaf twisted with the inverse of that. Right? So this embedding is the same thing as an element in H0x omega xq log delta tensor A inverse. A inverse. Okay? And now let's see. So if Q is, uh, is N, so the equal to the dimension, and A is, say, ample, then the vanishing of this is just the uh, Kodaria vanishing. Okay? So a generalization of that is to say, well, I want smaller Q and uh, accordingly, smaller bound on the Kodaria uh, dimension of A. So to put it as a vanishing theorem, so if the Kodaria dimension of A is larger than Q, then, then this sheaf has no global sections. That's the vanishing. But a way to say it is that any uh, subline bundle of this sheaf has a bound on the Kodaria dimension. Now, how does this work for uh, 
singular varieties. So, well, and of course, I, I need x projective and say x delta log canonical. And then um, we need some room here. So delta is not always reduced. So here we just take the largest reduced divisor that's contained in delta. And then omega x log of that is not necessarily locally free. So we need to take the reflexive ones. So what this means is that you take these kind of uh, different forms on the open set, or rather on the, well, on the open set where the pair x delta lower bound is simple normal crossing. So this is sort of included in being locally uh, or low canonical that x is normal and in general uh, on a big open set delta will be simple normal crossing. So you take that open set, take these differential forms and push it forward. So it's the reflexive hull of those. So if we take a, a subsheaf that also doesn't have to be a line bundle, but it can be a, a Q Cartier reflexive of rank one, which is essentially the, if you want, it's a veil divisorial uh, sheaf, a Q Cartier veil divisorial sheaf. And then the same uh, statement that the quadratic dimension of A is at most Q. And Essentially, with that uh, extension theorem, uh, one can prove this uh, kind of the same way as the, uh, the original one. OK? So I think I kind of got a little technical here. So I'm going to go back to that. Um, I wanted to, to note that uh, another completely different application of this extension theorem was uh, uh, was applied by uh, Kolar in his deformations of elliptic Calabi-Yau uh, uh, manifolds. So he's looking at deformations of color, elliptic calabi and he's asking if the deformation is calabi how is there a condition that ensures that it's still elliptic? I'm sorry? So there's an elliptic uh, vibration. So the question he's asking is that if you have a deformation that's Calabi-Yau, does the elliptic vibration deform as well? And what he proves uh, using this extension theorem is that uh, out, except for a, a couple of counterexamples, it is true. I'm sorry? Like it's not like right, exactly. That, that's one of the... So, uh, Elliptic curves, elliptic curves and K3s uh, give uh, uh, elliptic curves times an abelian variety and, and K3s uh, give counterexamples. But all the counterexamples are ruled out if you assume that H2 of OX is zero. So if it's Calabi-Yau, you know, depending on the definition of Calabi-Yau, if you assume that, all, that OX has no higher cohomology and the dimension. Yes, so basically he needs the uh, needs some extension group to, to vanish, and he translates that to uh, some uh, differential sheaf of differential forms having no global sections, and that's where the, uh, this comes in. Okay, so uh, okay, we have that. We have that. Okay, so let's see. Uh, uh, Newer results. Oh, right. So let me just say it in words. So Kallström, I think. Uh, oh, OK. I'll, uh, so this was uh, also proved by not sure, Kallström. OK. In 11, so this part, not the extension theorem, just that. LZ holds 
if x is KLT. And um, okay, so I'm sorry? That's right, in a different way. And okay. So Patrick Graf and myself prove the following. So one thing that, that follows from our work is that if x is low canonical, then the extension theorem holds. And by this, I mean that pi r star omega x little, oh, sorry, I shouldn't. Um, OK, I take this back. Uh, this is what's, what holds. Uh, I forgot what I, what I defined the extension theorem to be. So for von forms, the extension theorem holds if x is log canonical. OK? And I'm sorry? Exactly. So for, for the lippmann zariski conjecture, I erased that, but uh, so for this corollary, uh, so I could say maybe the von Straten Steinbrink observation is that the extension theorem for omega of one implies lippmann zariski Okay, so the corollary of this is that if LZ holds if X is LC. And this part, again, was independently proved by Duell, uh, not using the, not uh, via the extension term. Okay, so what we proved is actually a little bit more. Perhaps interesting. So again, we were interested in extending logarithmic forms. So our theorem is about that. So here's the here's theorem one. So let's say x is normal, and we have a log resolution. So again, by log resolution, I mean that the exceptional set is a divisor of its simple normal crossings. And assume that there exists any divisor on x twiddle and any SNC divisor such that The push forward of the differential one forms with logarithmic poles along this divisor is a reflexive sheaf. Then that sheaf is reflexive as well. So the push forward of omega x to the one is reflexive. So if you take uh, the extension theorem from GKKP, uh, this says that there exists a divisor for which this is reflexive. So it implies that then that, so that's how this follows. So in fact, we can make it a little bit better and say that if there exists a delta such that x delta is low canonical, then this is reflexive. Now this doesn't have anything to do with delta, but when you assume that x delta is low canonical, uh, so that might hold without x being low canonical. So it's a little bit more, more general. <laughs> so, 
So, uh, <laughs> right. So, um, right. Actually, right. Um, so there's a there's a version that Graf and I proved that's about Dubois singularities. So in fact, you get an extension theorem uh, for Dubois singularities. For so essentially. Something like this, where Dreadfiddle is defined, if you take, say, the, the preimage, uh, the entire preimage of, of uh, D. So if you have a pair XD, that's a Dubois pair, and you take D twiddle to be the, uh, take P inverse D, and then the reduce divisor supporting on that. Then the same same thing holds for arbitrary Q uh, the same way. And semi-low canonical is Dubois. Okay, so then uh, as soon as you can make sense of these things, yeah. then then, uh, then, then it holds. Important. Yeah. So, well, mm, okay. Maybe lying a little bit. We may have assumed that X is normal here. But um, so I'm pretty sure that, so that all you semi log canonical plus normal implies log canonical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought you were interested yeah. in non normal clicks. Yeah, yeah. No, I am just interested in LD. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, but what you said is more interesting. Uh, I was just saying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, so actually, as, as long as you're only interested in LZ, then all of so in the case when if you're only interested in LZ, yeah. then uh, omega uh, the canonical sheaf is a line bundle. In that case, all of these uh, assumptions are the same. So log canonical is the same as Dubois is the same as semi log canonical. So if you have normal and omega x a line bundle, then there's no difference between that. The big jump is to go from KLT to log canonical or any of those. So that's sort of the other the these other ones of for the algae case make no difference yeah. okay so it's possible that something must be low canonical and when you add that assumption right but that's so this is for the extension thing so for LZ that doesn't happen because for uh, so if if uh, the canonical sheaf is a line bundle then x delta being low canonical implies that x is low canonical it's only yeah. So that's why I keep saying that if you only if you only care about LZ, then that doesn't matter, and then this delta doesn't matter here either. Okay. And then of course, so a corollary of this is that LZ holds, right? And then so so this means that we can basically get rid of this uh, divisor here. But uh, you might be interested in extending logarithmic forms. So if you start with a divisor on x, you might want to keep some of the uh, components of that d. And the thing is that you st so if you do that, then you might have to include some exceptional divisors. So here's, uh, here's theorem 2. Let's say x delta is LC and pi is a log resolution of the pair. The additional thing is just that the exceptional uh, divisor, which was assumed to be SNC here, is now assumed to be a simple normal crossing divisor when you add the proper transform of delta, so the, the intersect transverse only. Okay, and um, where am I? Right, so now let's say that D twiddle is a reduced divisor satisfying the following uh, conditions. So if you take the exceptional set of pi, which is now a divisor, so I think of this as a divisor now, and you take the image 
of the round down of delta and take their wedge, which means the largest divisor that's contained in both. Okay? Okay. So this is essentially the exceptional divisors that map to this guy. Okay? So D would have to con D twiddle would have to contain that and contained in the preimage of the round down of delta. So I'm thinking that we're starting with uh, uh, differential forms with logarithmic poles along this divisor, and we want to pull those back, back to the uh, resolution and extend those uh, to the entire x twiddle. And basically, this divisor is what we have to add in order to do that. So in that case, so this is the assumption. Then. The push forward of omega x twiddle one log d twiddle is reflexive. So compared to this theorem, so this theorem says that well, if this holds, that this is reflexive. So well, that's fine. Uh, but here we needed to to add this divisor for sure so you can add so you have to add all the exceptional divisors that map to the original and then whatever you want with the with the origin so if you want you can drop some of the original guys but you you cannot drop you cannot necessarily drop anything in between so just the fact that this is reflexive doesn't mean that everything in between is reflexive this make sense? So we have to add some divisor to um, to get that, and then uh, we could drop everything, but not necessarily in between. Let me try to make that more clear. So, in other words, you could ask, well, okay, this is fine, but couldn't I just say? just this condition. Let's say D twiddle is contained in here. Isn't that uh, true? Well, it turns out that it, it's not. I think I'm over time. But so I, I have one page to, to make two statements. And then I wanted to tell you something about the proof, but I think I'll skip that. So, uh, so here's the theorem, which kind of says, so this states the limits of this extension. So this is about uh, how we need to include some of those exceptional divisors. So if x delta is log canonical and pi is a log resolution, Let's say that d twiddle is this pi inverse of the round down of delta. And assume that either x is q factorial, meaning every VL device is q Cartier, or that it's two dimensional. And then for any divisor B on X twiddle that lies between the proper transform of delta, so contains this and is contained but not equal to that D twiddle, then the sheaf, uh, the sheaf, pi r star omega x little one log b is not reflexive. So the first theorem says that you can go all the way down here. 
The second theorem says that if you add some exceptional divisors, then, then you're good. And this says that uh, if you go below, uh, wait, I think I'm, ah. I think I misstated. Okay. This is obviously silly, I think. Wait. Ah. No, okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, Maybe I should look up what the exact, so uh, maybe you see, so I'm a little, um, I'm a little confused because this seems a little bit contradicting that, right? So. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me see. Okay, I think, uh, right, so I'm sorry. So this should be this guy here. So, um, sorry. So the statement is that if we go below this one, Okay, just apparently we made a typo in the paper and I, I went by that. I wasn't thinking when I prepared the talk. But basically this theorem is, is supposed to say that this one is optimal, that you need to add this guy definitely. And if you go anything below that, then uh, um, yes. Okay. So, uh, so that's that, and I'm way over time. Uh, one thing I, I would like to add that, that it's relatively easy to see that, so there are plenty of examples that for higher forms, uh, the extension theorem fails for log canonical. So, uh, so this one holds for arbitrary forms, but, uh, but if you want to do it for log canonical, in this form, so without the uh, without the log uh, in the extension, you need you do need to add exceptional divisors if you have higher. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So, um, right. So Bert is pointing out that you. Even if you just look at the definition of low canonical singularities, uh, you might have to do that for, uh, for top differential forms. But what's actually true is that there's, there's an example uh, where you pick up a logarithmic pole along a divisor whose, di whose discrepancy is zero. So this is sort of uh, trickier that uh, so it's not just the, the discrepancy minus one divisors that cause a problem. 
low chemical uh, singularities cause problems for uh, higher forms elsewhere. Okay, well, I'm sorry for the overtime. And